Good morning, everybody. Good morning for people here in the auditorium too. Uh, we have the pleasure to, to have a Christian mass uh, today. I will indeed ask Ron to introduce the speaker. So Ron, uh, please. Christian, thanks very much for accepting the invitation. Thank you. So, okay, so thanks. Please. Uh, I would also like to thank you personally for accepting this invitation. Uh, it's really uh, an honor and uh, I think very interesting uh, topic, uh, tigers or not, but I mean the questions of entropy. Uh, Christian Meis uh, got his PhD in 1988 at Rutgers University. Uh, I believe your advisor was uh, Joel Lebovitz. And uh, I would say that uh, Professor Mais, he's been professor at uh, the Catholic University. Uh, sorry if I didn't pronounce that correctly, in Leuven, uh, Belgium, since year 2000, and uh, is currently a full professor uh, at the university. Um, so he's really one of the leading mathematical physicists. Our time and uh, is, it concentrates uh, especially in statistical physics, non equilibrium statistical physics, interacting particle systems, uh, fluctuations, entropy, entropy production. Uh, he's worked on stability of non equilibrium steady states, uh, long range correlations in uh, driven systems, active matter. Uh, theory of large deviations. Uh, something that I would like to understand better called frenzy. And what really uh, piqued my interest uh, recently when I checked his uh, list of publications is uh, a classical subject from cycle physics called the Weber Fechner law, which uh, says that our response to stimuli is uh, logarithmic. So uh, a wide range of, of uh, very interesting applications of mathematical physics and statistical mechanics. So thanks very much for agreeing to uh, speak today. And it to you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, very kind introduction. Um, so uh, good morning, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure and an honor to uh, be able to give this colloquium this morning with a title um, which, um, well, which is maybe a bit special, special to you. Uh, it's about the entropy of a tiger. Now, uh, I hope you do not necessarily expect here a number as the, at the end of my talk, which would give you the entropy of a tiger. But, um, and in fact, that this poor tiger, even though it has a nice picture, it will end up being, in the end, some kind of a, a bit of a mathematical model. And at best, it will be becoming a suspension of E. coli bacteria. Um, but the reason for asking what is the entropy of a tiger, you know, one has to think widely. And uh, the question is really, what would it mean to speak about entropy of living matter and what does that what does that give us why would we care to speak about that so in other words the purpose is a bit more conceptual it is like how to extend equilibrium thermal properties uh, how to do thermal physics out of equilibrium for example to ask is there an Ernst heat law a third law for low temperature behavior in non-equilibrium or there are anomalies like the Schottky anomaly that we know for specific heats. And below, beyond and below all that, there is also the question, in what sense do specific heats or entropy show non-thermodynamic features? And there we will touch, I hope, perhaps on aspects of response theory, which in non-equilibrium indeed are not purely entropic as in the fluctuation dissipation relation, but also have an important uh, frenetic part. Okay, so tigers are non-equilibrium systems, if you do not know. That's why I use them as um, not only for non-equilibrium, but they somehow represent the fire of life. Now, what do we mean by non-equilibrium? Well, here I will be speaking mostly about steady non-equilibrium. 
which means that we have a macroscopic condition where currents of matter, energy, and so on, are maintained in the steady state so that we get like a stationary condition which is irreversible. You can see an arrow of time. Now, obviously, what I just say is not like a mathematical definition. And in fact, as always in physics, it depends, of course, on time scales, energy scales, the type of observations and manipulations you have available. But so in general, the feeling of non-equilibrium is that you have currents maintained, that there is dissipation, that there is heat going to the environment. So we are restricting ourselves here to open stationary systems, which are maintained for a long time by some aspects of uh, reservoirs. Um, so to show an arrow of time and in particular to dissipate energy and to show entropy production. So that's in general what this tiger is standing for. The tiger is more than just non-equilibrium. I will come to that because it's also active, but we will come to that a bit later. So non-equilibrium has to be, of course, something anti-equilibrium. So let's first start with equilibrium, perhaps. Equilibrium, well, I mean, um, it's about balances, basically, right? That's how we learn equilibrium, thermodynamics, statistical mechanics. The main players are their energy, volume, particle number. And then what you put in the balance is, well, the thermodynamic potentials. And the most important generator or the mother of all thermodynamic potentials, that's called the entropy. And it is by energy entropy balances that you try to characterize in great detail uh, the fluctuations and the response of uh, equilibrium systems. Now let us zoom in a bit on that essentially unique entropy you have in equilibrium. It's really miraculous. I mean, you can have a lecture um, of two or three about this slide because it's a bit miraculous that there is essentially a unique entropy or a unique thermodynamic potential in equilibrium, which at the same time is related to heat. That's the origin of the Clausius heat theorem, right? I mean, the fact that you have that the, the heat, reversible heat over temperature is an exact differential defining entropy, which is then also this increasing in the universe, as is said in Clausius heat theorem, that's, that's the origin of, of entropy. But somehow miraculously, it is also related to fluctuations, to probabilities. That was the great insight of people like Boltzmann and later also Planck Einstein who emphasized that. At the same time, you can have very specific um, ideas of how the change of entropy is always monotone, increasing until the equilibrium condition. So there is an arrow of time which is related to that entropy. That's a second law also called the Boltzmann H theorem. And if that is not enough, there is still also a deep and important relation with linear response around equilibrium. Namely, there is the fluctuation dissipation theorem. Dissipation enters there not by accident in the world. It's really entropy is governing also the linear response. And not only that, even you have something like entropic forces, namely in general statistical forces, which are purely somehow uh, generated by the law of large numbers, you could say. So you see, there's this plethora of various things in physics, heat, fluctuation, time, response, forces, that all somehow end up with one and the same entropy in various ways. I mean, it's, you can say, okay, it's maybe a free energy or a Gibbs free energy sometimes, but it's basically an entropy which is governing all of that. Actually, if you want to make a, if you want to make a t-shirt, which is somehow different than the Maxwell laws or the Lagrangian of the standard model, I think I have not seen such a t-shirt which would collect these formulas, which summarize what I just said, Clausius, Boltzmann, Kubo, Onsager, that's the t-shirt you want to buy um, or make, uh, where you have basically all of equilibrium statistical mechanics. If you understand all of these equations or inequalities, then you have gone a long way already in equilibrium statistical mechanics, and you start to understand even equilibrium thermodynamics. Now, let me just to make sure, uh, zoom in on a, a couple of these aspects. So one thing I was saying that is this remarkable insight of Boltzmann related to fluctuation theory. And so here is a very simple example of that. I'm not sure whether you see my pointer, but um, to the left here, I see the probability, say, of a gas 
in a gas that we have a density fluctuation. So the N over V number of particles per volume, you want to know what is the probability that I see a certain density, a density profile. Well, here is a very important fact. I mean, maybe one of the most generating equalities of, of statistical physics that this is given by, I mean, this is called the fluctuation formula. This can be given approximately by the exponential of minus the inverse temperature, the volume, and then you see here an excess or a difference in what I would call free energy. I mean, it depends a bit on what question you're asking, what the probability is that you're doing, but basically it's a difference between the free energy, which is corresponding to this strange, perhaps density and the equilibrium free energy. So that is the great insight of Boltzmann, Planck, Einstein. Einstein wrote a very nice article, I believe in 1911 about opalescence, the first four pages, they are remarkable and they explain all of these things, how indeed you get that these thermodynamic potentials give you the fluctuations of macroscopic variables. And an immediate, an immediate implication is that you understand from that how variational principles characterize equilibrium. The Gibbs variational principle is just saying, well, what is the equilibrium profile in the density? It is the one which minimizes, of course, this exponential because there is a big volume here and a beta with a minus sign. So you get that the typical probabilities they get of order one when these are equal to one and all the times this is positive. So that's the variational principle that you have in thermodynamics and statistical physics. It is directly related to the role of entropy as what we call a fluctuation functional. Um, I also wanted to say, because this is less known and somehow it's hidden in most of the textbooks, actually I do not know a single reference where this is discussed, I must say, that the fluctuation dissipation relation and the Kubo formula, which I'm not explaining here in detail, but maybe you recognize the left-hand side as the response for an observable O where you have had a perturbation with potential V of a time dependent perturbation with amplitude h as the linear response formula of Kubo gives you that the change in the expectation of the observable O, if you add this time dependent perturbation, is given by this formula. But this formula, which is where the textbooks mostly start, stop, you can write as a correlation between the observable and the entropy flux, namely the change of entropy energy, sorry, because of the potential that you add minus the work done. That's exactly the heat over the temperature. The beta has the inverse temperature in it. So that's exactly the correlation of the observable with the uh, entropy flux. So in that sense, linear response around equilibrium is entropic. That's also why on our t-shirt we had this uh, fourth formula here that the change of an observable is the correlation of the observable with the entropy flux. Okay, so this is all about um, basically the interpretation of what I just said. Let me just end with one more thing that, I mean, a lot of work that people are doing in like thermodynamics of biological systems, chemical physics, is really about landscaping. It's really about following the landscape as given by the free energy. I mean, as long as you have not been going deeply into the subject of non-equilibrium statistical mechanics, that gives you a very good entrance to what is called irreversible thermodynamics. Basically, you use a kind of heterogeneous free energy or entropy, um, which you use uh, local equilibrium ideas to go to uh, balances again. Balance laws would give you this thing which is uh, summarized in the book of the Groot and Mazur, which is called irreversible thermodynamics, and which is used to, with great success where you think of uh, processes, many natural processes, as basically um, processes that you can imagine like a toboggan on, on, on a car on such a, on such a toboggan. This is not what we are going to do. We are going to do real non-equilibrium and we want to go far from equilibrium because tigers are not close to equilibrium. Okay, so um, as I said, this non-equilibrium will be about stationary but driven or active systems. I will come back to that. But just to give you a little bit of an idea of what it could mean, well, I mean, the simple system is that you take a metal bar, which is connected on one side with a high temperature reservoir and on the other side with a low temperature reservoir, and you keep the ice bucket here to the right and you keep your steam 
bucket to the left fixed and at the same temperature and then you will see an energy current and you may wonder this system inside this conductor how does it look like what are the fluctuations could it be that the current reverses what is the probability of a certain density and all of that you can ask that for heat conduction you can ask that for the for transport of particles like the membrane uh, the ion channels inside and outside the cell but there are of course many other models turbulence where you have like external forces you have belt driven lattice gases where you have a hopping of many body dynamics and of course you have a whole world of um let's say living matter which evades the decay to equilibrium as erwin schrodinger was summarizing in his book what is life which now has come to the forefront as well of physics and of non-equilibrium statistical physics in particular where the kind of particles living matter are today called active systems or active matter and most of the time we have very simple mathematical models and uh, phase transition and jamming transitions that are studied today um, like if you look at the archive in soft condensed matter it's like every day full of uh, messages about uh, active matter okay so that's the general context of non-equilibrium and here currents are maintained it's different it's not equilibrium okay so if you ever worry about non-equilibrium being very special and somehow very specialized i think um, it's not truly true i think every department of physics should really spend time with the students on non-equilibrium statistical mechanics especially today because if you want to do things which are important for our planet like asking about climate science about sustainability about efficiencies energy etc you have to study non-equilibrium, either thermodynamics or statistical mechanics. But if you're interested in cosmology, if you're interested in early universe cosmology, or if you're interested in astrophysics, you better come to term with knowing what you're talking about if you're doing non-equilibrium. These are non-equilibrium things. But also if you're doing turbulence, but in you do biological functioning, but even interdisciplinary aspects going to economy or sociology, Many of the interdisciplinary physics that you meet there is related some way to non-equilibrium statistical mechanics. Okay, so that was um, kind of the introduction. Now let's go a bit deeper into how to study non-equilibrium statistical mechanics. So the first, the first thing you do to, uh, to study non-equilibrium is to look at something which is called close to equilibrium. Now close to equilibrium, <laughs> you have to define that but basically it means that you know you have these two temperatures there the low temperature and the high temperature of the metal bar suppose they are somehow very close to each other suppose that the differences in chemical potential are very small suppose that the external non-conservative you know the rotational forces like in turbulence suppose that they are very small all of these things suppose you're almost dead you know so you're close to equilibrium what what is the thing what is the theory you can make of that well in fact close to equilibrium we we know a lot and uh, much of the things is of course due to the linear response theory of the 1950s and the 1960s i already mentioned google but there is also an ensemble which somehow is not very well known it's called the mclennan ensemble this is a paper of 59 already but uh, somehow not very well known that is about statistical mechanics of the non-equilibrium steady state but close to equilibrium and um, somehow, um, well, that has been long time forgotten, not mentioned. Sometimes you see it when people are doing quantum solid state physics calculations. Sometimes they call the Zubarev ensemble, which is the kind of quantum version of the MacLennan ensemble, MacLennan Zubarev. But basically, um, this exists in uh, generality of non equilibrium statistical mechanics. I will not explain what it is, but I just wanted to tell you that it's one of the things you want to know about if you're not studying tigers, but you want to start with non equilibrium. The same thing is that there is a variational principle close to equilibrium, which is called the minimum entropy production principle, which is in fact due to my compatriot, the famous Ilya Prigozhin, who um, close to equilibrium in the so-called formulation of linear irreversible thermodynamics already in the 40s and the 50s has been understanding the validity and what you can do with this minimum entropy production principle and then thirdly what is also not very well known but which is more relevant for today is that in fact there is a closure's heat theorem close to equilibrium i will explain this little bit not too much but you have to understand that the essence of closure's heat theorem 
is that you're able to identify an exact differential, which is basically a heat over a temperature. Now you may wonder what heat are we talking about, but okay, I will talk about it, but you can in fact show that this heat divided by temperature for non-equilibrium makes still an exact differential in first order linear around equilibrium, but not in second order. That's sometimes why people say entropy doesn't exist for tigers or does not exist for non-equilibrium. That's because it clearly fails to reproduce in the most naive sense the Clausius heat theorem for say non-perturbative non-equilibrium statistical mechanics. So all of these things that I just now mentioned about close to equilibrium, they basically have been, I mean, like the, between 2010 and 2015, Karl Netochny and me have been cleaning up this whole area of close to equilibrium statistical physics, going from McLennan over entropy production closures and laws of Prigogine. So I think these four papers basically give you a summary of all you have to know about close to equilibrium, non-equilibrium statistical mechanics. But what about tigers? Well, um, as I said, entropy and its principles will no longer suffice to describe all of these things that I mentioned, you know, my t-shirt with entropy, it will no longer be like that. There will be not a unique entropy and there will be other things that will enter, things like escape rates, things like accessibility, or more generally things like which are, which we would call in the old fashioned way, the kinetics. That will start to matter in many more details. And one of the main challenges of non-perturbative, non-equilibrium statistical mechanics is to find your way in this many details of the kinetics to understand whether, is there any chance still to speak about non-equilibrium statistical mechanics starting say, from second order on non-equilibrium. I mean, somehow life starts in second order around equilibrium. And the question is, can you still find your way there? Is there still something systematics? And I will try to, towards the end, say that, well, in fact, there is a kind of minimum thing you can do, which works already quite well. And that is that not only you want to speak about entropy, but also about frenzy, which is a kind of dynamical activity, which is extremely important for non-equilibrium physics and somehow the miracle is if you come from the non-equilibrium point of view that is frenzy and this entropy they merge close to equilibrium to disappear in a multitude of entropic things that you see in, in equilibrium but if you go higher up in the mountains you know where the river has like various streams you will see there is not only the entropic stream but there is also other streams that that join to make this equilibrium river called entropy Okay, but let us first see how that um, insight has uh, was already there long ago. So I'm here having a paper of 1975. Sorry for the bad quality of the copy. Perhaps we are in physical review of August 75, and I see a paper by Rolf Landauer, and the title of the paper is nothing less than saying the inadequacy of entropy and entropy derivatives in characterizing the steady state. You know, the steady state is what was used in that time to really speak about non-equilibrium statistical mechanics. You had the same title basically in the paper by McLennan of 59. He speaks about the steady state, like um, in, in, in uh, contra in somehow to, in opposition with the equilibrium state. So what uh, Landauer is saying there, what he says, well, the things that you're used to do in irreversible thermodynamics, like this, max, this minimum entropy production principles, this kind of more or less closest heat theorem, forget it when you're going far from equilibrium. For example, and this is a conversation he had with Charlie Bennett, here I have this quote, to, to determine whether under a given set of planetary conditions, life is the preferred state or only like temporary, we cannot just compare the lifeless state and the known biological state in the sense, you know, it's not a state function. That's what Landauer is saying. If you want to know the probability of life to find the tiger, it's not so much that you have to look at, you know, what is this, just this tiger? What is, the, what is, this, what is this life state? Ben Landauer is saying we must go to look at transitions. You have to look at transitions between states, which means you have to look, I mean, in my words, I would say it means that you have to look about lifetimes. You have to look about accessibilities. You have to look about dynamical activity or in the old fashioned word, you have to look at kinetics. That is basically what they said in more detail already in 1975 in this, in this paper by Landauer. 
No, just a remark that I want to have, and that is that there was a time, and maybe it's still, it's, it's still a much alive today, that, um, you know, um, far from enough from, I mean, if people look at life, um, they often emphasize a lot that life can only be there as a result of a steady state, which is dissipative. So this is called dissipative structure. Life is a dissipative structure, one says. One has to emphasize that there is always this arrow of time, which has a certain dissipation rate. And sometimes we see that people are tempted to expect that there is a kind of positive correlation between the dissipation rate and efficiencies or things which are beneficial for life. That is not true. That is just not true. I mean, it is not so simple. It is not that the further you go from life and the more kind of structure you want to have and more order, that is somehow that there is a thermodynamic hierarchy in the biological classification of species, which is just a matter of lower entropy. It's not like that. I mean, it's not like the tiger has a lower entropy than, uh, I don't know, than the potato or something like that. That's not what is happening. That is just not true. I mean, if you want to look at this in more detail, we wrote a paper with Marco Baiesi about the fact that life and efficiency certainly does not always increase with the dissipation rate. But in fact, this thing like dynamical activity and again, these kinetic aspects start to matter much more. That was just an aside. Okay. I think we are ready to start um, the colloquium. Let me just see what time it is now. Uh, clock here somewhere, just a second. All right. So what is the entropy of a tiger and why would you care? Well, um, remember that I have been emphasizing that entropy has many functions, many phases, as I was saying, um, going from heat, fluctuations, response, uh, forces, all of these things. Now, the point is that you cannot really expect this to be true in non-equilibrium. So we have to make a choice. So we will leave the concept of entropy as it is dictated somehow by equilibrium, but we rather look at one aspect of entropy, which has to do with heat, which has to do with thermal properties. So the point of view that I will take, if I ask myself, what is the entropy of a tiger? I will not be, I mean, I could ask other questions, but here in this talk, I will ask, is there a physically well-motivated thing that makes sense, a specific heat or heat capacity for these non-equilibrium systems, for this active, driven, open, stationary system on the particular time scale and energy scale that you are interested in? So that's really the question in the, in the title of, of this colloquium. All right. Um, so next slide is where? All right, so um, just, okay, just, just one more historical uh, thing to just get you more of enthusiasm here. And that is that, you know, that specific heats or heat capacities have played an enormously important role in any revolution that you, well, on physics in particular of the 20th century. Um, like if you look at the, the end of the 19th century, people there, the, most of the time, the, the, the men with the beards, they knew that their understanding was phys of physics was incomplete because they had no clue about the specific heats. I mean, there was experimental evidence that it was wrong. They, you, you could not trust, you know, these equipartition type theorems anymore. So Maxwell already in the 1860s, after, you know, giving a lot of nice results on the molecular nature of matter and uh, speaking about kinetics, diffusion, and all that you have, he concludes by saying that, you know, I, can, I put before you what I consider to be the greatest difficulty yet encountered. And that difficulty of which Maxwell spoke, of which Gene spoke, of which um, Gene spoke, of which um, uh, Planck spoke, that has to do with specific heats. I mean, when Einstein was giving his talk on the first Solveig conference in 1911 in Brussels, his subject was specific heats. I mean, so I think that specific heats can tell you something. And that's also why I'm not ashamed to, to talk about specific heats, and in particular that I interpret 
entropy. I mean, how do you measure entropy? If you have specific heats, so that I want to understand what do we mean by specific heat, heat capacities out of equilibrium. Okay, so the question is, do we define, do, can we define a physically well-motivated heat capacity for tigers? And so here is an, a question which, um, excuse me that it sounds a bit brutal, but it's just a thought, it's just a, you know, a thought experiment. I mean, you, you can imagine the following question being asked. You take, I mean, let's not talk about tigers, but something which are like living matter in general. And suppose you just cut it to pieces. You know, you just break life. So the question is, if you now go to this unorganized mixture of molecules, right? Does it have the same specific heat as before? In other words, if you do life matter or dead matter, suppose it's the same matter, does it have the same specific heat? Is there more life? matter than thermodynamics and is there more than just the material i mean i think that the first idea that typical physicists have i'm not sure about you of course but it's not very strange to have the idea that it doesn't matter i mean if you think about my liver um and i take my liver um in vivo and i want to know its specific heat i can imagine that it's very natural to think that if i take out my liver god forbid and I put it in the fridge or whatever, or I take it in a specific heat calorimetric bomb and all of that, that I wouldn't see that there is life in my liver or anything like that. But I claim it's wrong. I claim that there is in fact an ingredient which is very much different. And that is the non-thermodynamic feature. Okay? So that's the shocking thing of my colloquium, I hope. That life matters for specific heat. All right, so let us try to, and that is of course, again very much related to the fact that life is i mean is non-perturbative non-equilibrium statistical mechanics it's just not like equilibrium it's not like you cannot reduce it to that and if you speak about specific heat you will pick up exactly these non-thermodynamic features these frenetic features all right so that if if that question what is the meaning of the entropy of a tiger and all the thought experiments you can imagine if that somehow survives after this colloquium I'm a happy man because now I'm going to enter into a little bit more of the, the technical uh, aspects of, um, of um, my colloquium. All right, so let us continue here. So what we will do is we will define a heat capacity, first of all, for out of equilibrium. And uh, this will not be an arbitrary thing, of course. It has to do with quasi-static transformations, but not between non-equilibrium steady states. So um, what you I mean, usually in, in traditional textbooks, uh, if we speak about relaxation, about convergence between one macroscopic condition and another, one somehow is always relating equilibrium. I mean, you go from one equilibrium and then you change the parameter and you go to a new equilibrium, things like that. But why not considering, you know, a tiger at one moment and a tiger at another moment, but changing parameters. What parameters? Well, changing the environment, basically, and see what happens. So you go to a system which is stationary, steady state, you change parameters, and you have relaxation to a new non-equilibrium condition. If that elementary change that you are doing to the environment is temperature, then you will be measuring the heat capacity mm -hmm. by measuring that excess heat. You know, tigers always produce, I mean, always, Tigers produce heat, there is always dissipation. I'm producing heat, you're producing heat. Um, I mean, non-equilibrium systems dissipate. They dissipate energy that's called heat to the environment. We are talking about open stationary non-equilibrium systems. So if you go from one non-equilibrium stationary to another non-equilibrium, you go from one heat that you constantly dissipate to another heat that you constantly dissipate, but there is something extra because of the change of parameters as the excess heat. It is not only that you have always heat that you produce, but there's an excess due to the relaxation from one non-equilibrium to another non-equilibrium, and that we call heat capacity. Okay? We will come back to that. Now, the second thing is, can you measure it? Can you compute it? Can you simulate it? Can you numerically find it? The answer is yes. 
So there are methods to compute, to measure it, but unfortunately, measurements of um, the heat capacities of living material or non-equilibrium in general uh, still has to really explode, still has to start. And I hope after this colloquium, it will uh, explode that everybody wants to measure these heat capacities of driven and active systems. But why do you care? Well, of course you could care because it's kind of nice that you have a good extension from equilibrium to non-equilibrium about heat capacities and that in that sense you can speak about the entropy of a tiger. But there is something which has always been the main thing about heat capacities even in equilibrium and that, that it is clarifying. Well, what was it doing in equilibrium? It basically was clarifying the degeneracies in the energy, right? It has to do with knowing the degrees of freedom. That's what was entropy and specific heat about in equilibrium. But here, that remains true, but there is something else that enters and that is what I was calling these accessibilities. It's not only that you have, maybe you reach a third level of energy or a fourth level, but it also tells us about these transitions that Landauer was speaking about in his conversation with Charlie, Be Charlie Bennett. And you may wonder exactly also as Nernst was wondering in the beginning of the 20th century, what happens at low temperature? Maybe you don't want to expose your tiger to these low temperatures, but certainly you can try to understand, is there a third law of non-equilibrium thermodynamics? Is it true that specific heats go to zero? And how do you show that <coughs> if you're not doing equilibrium statistical mechanics? Okay, so that is the challenge. That's both mathematical, experimental, physics, heuristics, theoretical challenges <coughs> of non-equilibrium heat capacity. All right. Good. So here is, um, I'm repeating with the figure, what we mean by heat capacity. So just look at this figure. So there is, the time is in the horizontal axis and in the vertical axis, basically you have the power, the dissipated power. You could say like the, the Joule heating if you wish, but okay, let's talk about the dissipated power. So before time zero, so to the left of the origin here, you have a certain power which is dissipated all the time which is constant, it's just a non-equilibrium system. But what you happen to do at time zero is that you're going to change a parameter, I call it X. So I change X to X plus DX. DX is the small change. The small change is there because of technical reasons that I'm not explaining because mathematics requires here that you go to so-called quasi-static transformations between non-equilibrium steady states. That's I mean, obviously that's technical, but, but that's possible. I mean, you can imagine small changes in a parameter so that you can really have this idea of quasi-static transformation also extended to the non-equilibrium world. So you change this parameter and then you wait. Well, if you wait long enough asymptotically, so here it's the asymptotics is after a certain relaxation time, which is finite, you go to a new power, which is dissipated. So you go from one dissipated power value to a new dissipated power value because okay, you have another parameter. Now, what do we mean by the excess work or the excess, um, well, basically the excess work, what do we mean by that? Well, we mean this area here, which you see in a pink brown um, area, which is the relaxation, which is the excess. You know, you have to do infinity minus infinity, basically. It's like a renormalization type thing, you know, because over time, if you integrate this over time, this power is infinity. If you go here, it's, if you integrate over time, it's infinity, but you're only interested in this area. That's the excess work. If I had to call this the dissipated power, but by the first law of thermodynamics, which has nothing to do with equilibrium or non-equilibrium, you can define an excess heat. And if you look at how this excess heat depends on the change in temperature, so when the X is temperature, then you get specific heat. So an immediate question that people are asking me when I say that is they say, but why, what temperature are you speaking about? I mean, non-equilibrium, does it have a temperature, a steady state, or does it have a temperature? Well, I'm not speaking about the temperature of the tiger even. I'm not speaking about the temperature of the non-equilibrium system. I'm speaking about the temperature of the environment. So I'm coupling the non-equilibrium stationary state to an environment in which it dissipates this heat. So it is this 
environment, this thermal equilibrium environment, which is one of the many reservoirs to which this non-equilibrium system can be coupled because there are different chemical reservoirs. Somebody is doing rotational forces in it. I don't know, anything that happens, active chemistry is happening. But there is also dissipation into a thermal reservoir, like the water in my body, basically, right? Or the water in the tiger's body or whatever. Or the environment in general. There is a certain temperature, and you may wonder how this excess heat is changing with the temperature, and that's a specific heat. And in equilibrium, it's exactly what we mean by the specific heat. So in other words, specific heat is, of course, not it's not even an equilibrium like that. It's not like the energy average or something and how it depends on the, on the temperature. That's not what it is. It is heat over temperature. That is what it is. But in non-equilibrium, you have to take these excesses. And so now you can start to worry about this. And uh, the worry should be for us in two ways, basically. Well, we have already a mathematical job to see that this is all well defined. But the next job is to see, can we compute it? Can we, at least for some model systems, get our hands on it? And is it exciting? And then secondly, is it anything interesting also experimentally? Do you want to learn? Can you learn something if you measure it? And what are the challenges there? OK. Good. So let me see that I'm not overdoing my time here. OK, so the, the, the main thing that I want to, well, not the main thing, but one of the important things that I want to tell you already is that this excess heat consists of a part which you see is an exact differential here and um, which is related to in fact the average energy and another thing which is not an exact differential but which is related to the frenzy which is related to the kinetics so in other words if you go to the basically if you basically kill the animal you will kill this term and you will only keep what you would call the energy maybe uh, or other things that you want to look at for specific heat Anyway, so we have to do non-equilibrium statistical mechanics computations will be the most challenging thing will be to calculate this frenetic part, which is the, what we call the pseudo potential. And um, let me just flash you um, some, well, some aspects. So one thing that you can learn is that, okay, one formula here is that, in fact, this excess heat, and in other words, also the specific heat in a way, is a, is a correlation function. It's not a very useful correlation function as I write it here, but nevertheless, I, I want to show it. So these, uh, these angular brackets, they refer to some kind of an expectation, you know, a statistical expectation and average. But it's, uh, it's not an average, it's a two-point function. So it's a correlation function. It's a correlation function between the energy plus the pseudo-potential. That's why I call it a pseudo-potential, because it kind of adds to the energy. But that has to be correlated with the change in the logarithm of the stationary distribution. I do not like this formula for one reason, and I like it for another reason. Why I do not like this formula is because in non-equilibrium statistical mechanics, if you have formulas where you have rho or log rho in it, it's no good, unless you know rho. But typically, you don't know rho. You only know rho, well, approximately perturbatively, maybe, or if you assume Gaussian, whatever. But in general, there is no meaning or not much of a meaning in log rho. And rho is just a statistical ensemble describing your non-equilibrium system, which you don't know. But why I like the formula is that clearly in equilibrium, the rho is like the Gibbs-Boltzmann distribution. It's basically the exponential of the energy. The V is zero. So you get here an energy, energy two-point function. So that's what we learn in school, that the specific heat can be calculated as the fluctuation of the variance of the energy. So that is how it is reproduced, except that now you get the non-equilibrium ensemble and you get this pseudo potential in it. But that's not the, the good way to calculate it, in fact. There are other ways to calculate it. Okay, so um, again, checking a bit the time, I think um, we uh, have to go on, but let me flash you some proof of that. Proof of principle, I would say, but it's, yeah, in a way it's proof of principle, but they are very simple systems. So what you see here is a calculation we did for a run and tumble gas. So these are basically, if you have a suspension of E. coli bacteria, which more or less can be thought of as little animals, which in contrast with Brownian particles have a certain persistence. So they have a persistence where they run in a certain direction and then suddenly by an exponential clock, 
they tumble and change their direction after which they run again at a certain fixed speed and with a certain persistence. So these are active particles. This is one of the simplest examples of what are called active particles. Here for a gas, which means dilute suspension of this E. coli. And if you are modeling that with these kind of run and tumble particles, which I said, I mean, there's nothing more to it than just run, tumble, run, tumble, run, tumble with certain persistence in an overdamped environment, then you find the heat capacity, which looks like that. So it's just the usual kind of Schottky anomaly you see here. You have here a temperature which goes uh, to infinity, but look here, something interesting happens. You see, this specific heat goes to zero at zero temperature. I mean, this is not done for this poor E. coli bacteria, but this is a model system where we can indeed take the temperature to zero and we get an exact solution, which is this orange curve. And then there is a kind of more sophisticated simulation with real things which basically reproduces also the same kind of curves. So that already shows you, I mean, we can calculate it, we can measure it, we can, uh, in the sense of computational physics, get a hold on predictions for the specific heat. Here, um, you see the same thing, but for different activities. So alpha is a measure of activity. You could say that this alpha is a measure of being alive. So the more, the bigger alpha is, the more you are dead, and the small alpha is the more you are alive. This inverse alpha is a kind of persistence that you have. So it could be monitored by basically the metabolic rate or by the, the food, the ATP uh, that you're giving or the sugar you're giving to your animals. Then you can see that you get different specific heat curves. In other words, you can monitor what, how good your behavior is of your animal by just looking at a specific heat as a function of temperature. And you will see various curves and various shifts that you have in these uh, anomalies that you're having. This is uh, even a more colorful picture. And here I'm plotting this picture just to show you something else. Here you have a heat capacity of what is not really a, a, a living animal, but more of a kind of a, what are called an information network of biology, a, a kind of you know, bioinformatic network, which is modeled here with a complete graph where you have a kind of random biases. So it's a non-equilibrium graph. And what you see is that depending on the strength, <coughs> excuse me, of the driving, which basically means the, the, um, the selection that you have in certain transitions, um, you see that it can be very different heat capacity, but at low enough temperature, which is not always the physical temperature, by the way, at which this is working, but at low enough temperature, you see this remarkable structure appearing. Somehow you get classes of heat capacity, they all go to zero. So there is again a nervous heat law. Actually, we can prove it mathematically. Um, so I think, I mean, now we have it. We have a proof of the third law of thermodynamics out of equilibrium, non-perturbatively we have now. But you see more than that, there is the approach to zero of this heat capacity and it teaches us just like you could see the difference between a quantum system and a classical system for equilibrium entropies. We see structures in the driving aspects of the graph, how they make the differences, how you go approach the zero of the heat capacity. But that's why we care about it. Um, okay, this is another variation. I mean, I guess this is always basically the same now, but uh, you can also add energy landscapes and see how various aspects of the energy landscape is, is changing that. And again, these are plots that we can make. These are numerical experiments. Uh, for the heat capacity as a function, basically, of metabolic rates or persistences. Now, another thing, which is now I'm coming to the experimental uh, thing. Um, we have not, I mean, unfortunately, I cannot do these experiments, but what is nice is that we have also a method to do it via differential calorimetry. So the formulas I was been giving you with this excess heat and all of that and this pseudo-potential, that's more like the theoretical thing, how you can derive theoretically these heat capacities. But we can prove, we can show that in fact, you can also obtain the heat capacities for non-equilibrium steady states by differential calorimetry, which means that you will modulate the temperature with certain frequency of your environment and you measure the heat current as a function of time if the heat, if the temperature modulation is at frequency omega and goes like a sine, for example, and the amplitude of your temperature is epsilon, of the change of your temperature, then the heat capacity is hidden in the out-of-phase component. 
So, I mean, people who are doing, huge, I mean, differential calorimetry, you can also do for equilibrium systems, but here you can also do it for the heat current. Of course, you have to subtract the steady heat current, but once you subtract the steady heat current, the out of phase component of the signal that you get gives you for low frequencies, gives you the heat capacity, which is a much more pleasant way of measuring heat capacity, because you can imagine that excess heat and excess work that, you know, this is a bit of a subtle thing, especially if it is a small signal. Um, you know, you have this big power, which is dissipated before and afterwards. And somehow you have to subtract two large numbers. And that is very unstable, I can imagine, for measurements. But this differential calorimetry is, think, is really promising to go to uh, better measurements. Okay, here I have been speaking about active systems so far. But in fact, you can already do this in the lab with just you know optical i mean toroidal traps <coughs> that we have been studying in the lab of chiliberto in lyon where you basically have an electromotive force for colloidal particles in a certain energy landscape which are being turned around the ring and for which you can look at the heat capacity and you can measure it and there this heat capacity in fact does not go to zero at zero temperature because it's too classical this is not a jump process this is a diffusion process with white noise driven this is a driven process because the F constant force on the ring is a rotational force, but it does not satisfy the Nernst third law at, uh, at zero temperature. Okay, um, so in other words, what we learn is we learn how to extend to, to, to non equilibrium, the low temperature. But just let me end, I hope I'm not too much over time now, but let me just end by emphasizing that heat capacity is in a way a response function and response in non-equilibrium is just not purely entropic fluctuation dissipation relation is violated and it is violated in ways we understand it is violated in ways which are kinetic which we have called frenetic nowadays because it kind of summarizes a particular type of kinetic constraints in non-equilibrium that for example is responsible for things like um negative differential conductivity, uh, blah, blah, blah. well, I'm not going to speak about particle transport probably, but if you take active driven lattice gases, you can see uh, non you can see negative differential conductivity in your, in your current. So you, you, this E here is the, not the energy, but the field. For high fields, you can go down with your current. And the reason is not because of entropy, but it's about frenzy. And uh, that is also what is playing in the, uh, things that we are doing for the heat capacity. Okay, I'm afraid that I will not have time to say more about the heuristics of entropy versus frenzy. I think I'm basically over time and let me not um, go on and on, but just let me end here and by saying that, you know, as Joseph Fourier was writing when he was doing his heat theory, that I think it is still true that if you go a non equilibrium and even to the life of pine and tigers, that you can do quantitative analysis with specific heats. Thank you. Thanks, Christian. Very nice talk. So the session is open for questions. So if somebody here has a question, you can come over here uh, close to the microphone, please. Okay. Or if somebody from from the home from the Zoom meeting. I'm sorry, I've been going over my time probably. Or... No, no, that's a, that was okay. I mean, I mean, we are not as strict with this. Okay. So it was okay, really. So Ron ha has a question or a comment, please. Okay. Well, uh, many many thanks uh, for this uh, seminar. Uh, I think I've been thinking. Uh, along with students in my group, about very similar questions. And uh, we definitely need to uh, extend this uh, discussion. But let me ask you a few things. Uh, this was a fascinating uh, seminar. And give me, it gives me some hope that maybe uh, there is some way to uh, define thermodynamics and uh, statistical mechanics for far from equilibrium systems. Uh, anyway, um, one question that I had is, when you speak of the excess heat, uh, is that what uh, 
people sometimes call the heat uh, over and above the uh, housekeeping heat? Yes. But you have to understand that it is in the relaxation from one non-equilibrium to another non-equilibrium. So what I was talking about in the dissipated power, that would be the housekeeping heat. That's what you do in your house, right? To keep your house warm. But then there is a parameter which is changing and you will have a new housekeeping heat in the end. And the excess is what you have due to that relaxation. In fact, this notion of excess heat indeed is not mine, right? This is something that goes back to, um, well, so I, think, I think that the earliest reference is, is Prigozhin and Glansdorf, but there have been many other people like Ono and the school in Japan of um, Sasa and all of that, all of these people who have been also exploiting a lot of these aspects. And we are using the same concept for the specific heat. Yeah. Uh, another observation uh, is, I didn't see once the uh, Shannon entropy form. And uh, I'm, I'm proud curious about that. I'm very proud about that. <laughs> I, came, I came close to it, but I said I didn't like it. You know, I came close to it when I was uh, doing this thing. But of course, I tried to avoid it because it would be, uh, I wouldn't like it at all that you would think of entropy as a kind of Shannon entropy. And finally, uh, coming back to the, the slide with the complete graph, uh, what about negative specific heats? Uh, uh -huh, are we... okay. Yeah, right, I didn't mention that. Actually, you see them in other cases as well. Uh, where is it? Like here also for this driven diffusion on the ring, you also see them. Uh, indeed, so in other words, what you're seeing here is that you have this kind of thing that I mentioned also, but only very briefly. I mean, think about particle transport. If you have particle transport and you push particles, I mean, your good Royce uh, Zia has been writing a paper which has the name or the title was um, uh, Getting Less from Pushing More. I, I think some title like that in the American Journal of Physics. This was a very inspiring paper for me. So it means that you can push particles more and get less current. I mean, the kind of intuition is, is very clear. Suppose I'm pushing particles through a channel, but the channel is rough. Suppose yeah. there are all kinds of obstacles in the channel. So if I push harder and harder, I will get more and more trapping possibly of these particles. And since I always increase the field, they just cannot get out of the trap to, to turn around and, and go back. So in other words, by pushing more, you trap, you jam more. And that's the origin of negative differential conductivity. The current goes down, even you push harder. Now, this intuition that you have with particle transport is, of course, not present in linear response around equilibrium. There you just have the linear slope, and the, the, the slope is positive. It's just given basically by the current-current uh, correlation function. So basically a diffusion constant, which is, which is positive. If you go away from equilibrium, non-perturbative, then this frenetic component enters. Why I call it frenetic? Because it's, again, the same, always the same thing that happens. It has different realizations, but it is responsible for this kinetic jamming that you are having. Okay, so now what you do for particle transport, you can have for thermal transport. Again, there you can have heat conduction, which goes somehow worse if you make the temperature differences bigger. Now in heat capacity, you have something similar that happens. It's similar in the sense that, you know, <laughs> you give heat somehow, you give heat to a system and the temperature goes down. Right? That's what happens with negative heat capacity. And the origin, at least mathematically, is exactly, again, that you have this frenetic response in your system, but more holistically, intuitively, you should imagine the following. You know, if you have these active particles or these different particles, they all somehow already develop a certain energy. So what you can imagine is that, you know, you get some things like negative friction also in the heat conduct or in the particle transport and because they have their own depot of energy. So it's somehow, you know, instead of, instead of giving, waiting for you to give them energy, you, they, they find it easier or more pleasant for certain reasons to give off the energy uh, instead at, at a certain, uh, easy, at certain temperatures. And that's mostly happens we see at low temperature. That is the origin heuristically of this negative heat capacity. 
But of course, oh. there's no reason in non-equilibrium to avoid negative heat capacities. It's only in equilibrium uh, that you can have positive, that it's a matter of stability to have positive heat capacities. Yeah. Except for gravitational systems. Well, there, there it's a bit more difficult to really find your way because there, there is no equivalence there between the canonical ensemble and the microcanonical ensemble yeah. because of yeah. long range interactions. So if you go in the microcanonical ensemble, all is well and stable. But uh, if you insist on the, on the canonical ensemble, you will find these negative heat capacities, which right. is fine with me, but it doesn't mean a great deal. Yeah. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. More questions, comments? Back from here. So maybe I can uh, make one. So when you start discussing the excess of heat, you said you were considering an infinitesimal change in the system parameter. Can you say something if the change is not uh, infinitesimal? It is a finite change? Uh, uh, of course, sometimes I can say something, but this is not the way I want to define heat capacity. You know, I want, this, I want to have this thermodynamic formalism of quasi-static transformations. I use the word quasi-static. Many people use the word adiabatic, but in non-equilibrium, this is not a very pleasant word because adiabatic, it really means that there's no heat going through. Right, I mean, or very fast things. So I, I think we should have our language here more towards quasi-static transformations. So it means that the changes are always kind of keeping up with the relaxation time of your system so that you kind of instantly relax to your non-equilibrium steady state. So this is a mathematical procedure, of course, this dx. If you're doing the measurements uh, computationally, then of course this dx is not infinitesimal. It's always something. Uh, and it works, of course. Uh, it has to do with relaxation times, which has to be sufficiently small. That's all. To have a kind of close to quasi-static transformation. I mean, it's an idea, no? It's a mathematical thing, this dx, uh, just to get the mathematics correct. But uh, in practice, I mean, just, uh, it's a matter of to see how much this is related to changes of energy you can have in a certain time. It's always relative. I mean, in the beginning slides, I also emphasize that whatever you do in thermodynamics or whether it's equilibrium or non-equilibrium, it depends on energy scales, time scales. It's always like that. But it would be, of course, a question to do it uh, quickly in the sense of a big change and see what happens. Except there, uh, I think much less universality you will get. Mm -hmm. Yes. OK, thanks. Welcome. More questions? Yeah. So then I think we can. I, I, I have just a question. Uh, yes, go ahead. Out of curiosity, uh, you have these heat capacities and they collapse in some different branches, right? I'm just curious about. Um, these things like? Yes, yes. So why does that happen? Do you have an idea or? Okay, okay. so um, I have, I have uh, yes and no. I mean, on the heuristic level, there is some idea that you can see, but there is not like a systematic understanding. That's part of our research program that we have now. But first of all, the, the collapsing to the right at high temperature that we understand more or less, you know, things at high temperature always behave classically, equilibrium-like, in fact. Now, the low temperature is much more interesting because indeed there you get a kind of classes and clusters. And one of the, the subjects of our research indeed is to understand what makes this quasi-universality and what it, in other words, teaches us about the system. I mean, why do you have uh, these going negative and these going positive? Why do they come together here? And as I was saying also during my talk, it seems to give you an idea about how the driving makes the structure of loops in these graphs. So it has to do with the structure of loops that you're having in your graph, that you get these universalities. But again, I mean, I want to be careful here and not to say too much. The thing you can expect, because we know mathematically, at least for enough models, uh, the thing we do know is that you go to zero at zero temperature, which is this extension of the third law of thermodynamics. So it's not so strange that there is a bit of convergence towards uh, the zero at low temperature. But indeed, it is remarkable that you get these kind of clusters, uh, the, these hairs somehow coming together 
and um, specifying classes. But you see, it's, it's a bit similar to equilibrium. You get at low temperature, the structures become somehow frozen out in a way and becomes much more visible. All the details kind of go away and you get to the essence of the thing. And I hope that our research, which is about excitations from zero temperature for non-equilibrium systems will also um, give that. By the way, um, related to that is you can ask, what is this approach? Is this exponential in temperature or is this power law in temperature? Again, this has to do with the frenetic component that you have in your, in your models. Okay. I, 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 I think this will be for next next colloquium. <laughs> yeah. Yes, you have to come back. Well, okay. Other questions, comments? No. I mean, next Last time maybe the entropy of black holes. Sorry? I mean, I think the entropy of a tiger is probably much more, it's just still a comment to Guillermo that the entropy of a tiger is probably much more complicated than the entropy of a black hole. Yeah. Okay, so thanks very much for the colloquium. Thank you for having me. Bye. I will stop the recording. If